Hey, deserving listeners, Brandon and Mary, 90 Day Fiance. Let's watch. I know you have the ability to do this. I have seen you do things for her, with her, because of her, at the age of 23, than any of the men I ever dated all the way up into their 40s. It's just gonna take some effort on your part. Okay, that is great. That's a great instinct that the mother has. We'll see how it works on him. But this is something that I could talk a long time about. But in brief, when I would work with people in this scenario, whether they were a teenager or an adult, I found that not only if I said that I believed in them, but if I truly did believe in them and conveyed that effectively, that it would be very helpful to the individual. We are not independent uh, creatures. We are an organism that is social. And a lot of our psychology and our motivation, our understanding of the world is dependent on the social construction that is being constructed around us socially. Uh, one of which is our belief or our motivation to be able to uh, overcome an obstacle. You know, I, I always think about this example that when I was a kid, I was two or three years old and I was with my family and we were at the bottom of this really steep and big hill and the car was at the top of the hill. We needed to get back up there. And my, uh, and we were, you know, it was late in the day and it was hot and I was tired and I wanted to be carried. And my parents were thinking, well, he's a little heavy, so it'd be nice if, uh, you know, big. <laughs> and I, uh, they said, well, it'd be nice if he could make it up the hill by himself. And I was complaining, you know, this is according to my family, I'm complaining and my older brother and sister are making their way up and, you know, and everyone's a little sluggish. And then my mom said, okay, let's get into a huddle. And my mom essentially said that uh, she believed in me and that I could, you know, it was essentially like, Kirk, you can do it. And then apparently I shot up the hill and with so much motivation and energy and I was, you know, to the top before the rest of my family even got halfway up. And it was a big hill too. In my memory, it was this kind of small hill, but we went back to, it was in Spokane, which is where my parents grew up. And we visited that hill recently and I saw how big it is. I mean, it's like, I don't even know, like maybe a quarter mile, uh, you know, distance, like up the hill. In my head, it was just like 20 feet or something <laughs> because I shot up the hill because my body and my motivation was altered by a pep talk or the way that other people saw me. So when it comes to people in this situation, having someone believe in you goes a long way. It's not just a nice thing that you're doing for someone. It can literally be the difference between someone doing it or not doing, doing it, particularly someone like Brandon who has a lot of relational traumas about uh, being abandoned and being harmed by his father, apparently. So that's a great instinct that the mom had, and not every parent has that instinct to say that. There's a lot of other parents or people on the show that will say uh, have a different kind of demeanor. They'll just be like, grow up, man up. And she was saying a lot of those things too, but it was accompanied by this, not only I believe in you, but, but she gave evidence as to why she believes in him. She says, I believe in you because you, you have done it before. I've seen you do it before. And not only are you just okay as an average adult, but you're better than every other guy that I have ever met up until the age of 40 or whatever she said. And so that will potentially give him the motivation and the belief. At the very least, it just while you're encouraging someone to do something, then at the very least it helps the relationship in that moment to be able to say such a thing. And I found that for kids that had behavioral problems, uh, depending on the family and the kid, but a good number of them had lived in a family where there wasn't that belief. The, the family might be okay. The family might be loving and stable-ish, but there was none of that mentorship where the parents or some someone in authority says, you can do it, I know you can. You're better than this, or 
I've seen you do this before, or I know you're smart and I know you can apply yourself. That's a very different message than apply yourself and stop screwing up and follow the rules. It's a completely different message and it has a very different effect on people. So I would provide that for the people and I would also encourage the parents to do it. I model it for them or I just flat out tell them that that's what they should be doing. And for some parents, it's very hard for them to do that because they didn't get that when they were growing up. I also speak for myself that when I started out in my career, I had a mentor who I'm interviewing on the audio podcast. And that, that episode might have already aired, by the way. But in that episode, I talk about how in the beginning of my career, I was 26. I just graduated from graduate school and I barely felt I was good enough to be a therapist. And my eventual mentor said, hey, how about you teach? And long story short, I, I was terrified. I did not think I was qualified. I, I had just graduated a few weeks ago. Most of the students were older than me and I thought they knew more than me. What gave me the right to teach? I wasn't planning on teaching, but I did have a desire to teach and his eternal and consistent belief in me. And it was just like a constant presence in my life. I believe in you, you can do this. I know you can do it and I've seen it. You're smart, you're capable. Here's why I think you, you can do it. That was pretty much the only thing that um, got me through those initial years of starting out as a professor. I wouldn't be here today necessarily if that hadn't happened because if I didn't become a professor right out of graduate school, it's, there's a chance I never would have actually pursued that sort of job. And even if I did, it's possible I wouldn't be able to meet the right people because getting a gig as a professor is kind of a, you have to know people you have to, you know, to get your foot in the door, especially in the system that I was in, you had to know somebody. And it, and it wasn't like it was shutting out people. It was like trying to recruit is a complicated process is the point. So anyway, and if I never taught, then I might not have developed the itch or the skills or the lifestyle to be here as a podcaster and YouTuber. So that belief in someone can go so far. I had a student come to me once and she had already graduated and she came to me and she said, she was telling me about all the accomplishments that she had achieved post-graduation. And I was really impressed. I was like, wow, like your practice is going well, you're, you're writing a book, you're teaching at a university, you're, you know, wow, I mean, you're really moving through this career, you're doing great. And she said that I, uh, she, cause before she graduated, she was contemplating having ambition and having this plan to achieve, but she had voiced that with other professors, or at least one or two, and found that they would kind of discourage her because they thought it was too ambitious. Whereas she came to me and I genuinely said to her, because I did know her very well, she was in my classes for a number of months, and I said to her, wow, you're perfect, you absolutely, are perfect for that plan because you're capable and you're ambitious and you're smart and you're charismatic and you, you're a good writer. And yeah, I have no doubt that you're going to su succeed in that, you know, something like that, that I said. And she said that, you know, and the interaction was brief. <laughs> it was a very brief interaction. It might've been exactly that length. And we never talked about it again. She told me after graduation that that tiny little conversation was the catalyst that gave her the ability to actually pursue it and achieve those things. Now, now of course, 100% of the achievement was on her. I mean, I didn't have anything to do with that, but, but that little bit of belief gave her that oomph to be able to get up that hill and, and be the first one to the car. Thank you, that, that means a lot. I definitely need a boost of confidence. And it seems to have worked. So we don't know if it will work. I'm, I'm sure it's more complicated than that, but it is being received well. And I'm, I'm really appreciating the mom, actually. I'm really appreciating her. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. If you're anything like me, 
your relationships are very important to you. And really, most of the reason why I make content, and perhaps a lot of the reason why you're here with me today, is to think about your relationships. And you know, evidence shows that strong attachments contribute to all sorts of positive outcomes, like improved well being or happiness, lowered anxiety, lower depression, better relationships with your kids. Now, one type of relationship that we're often talking about here is romantic relationships or soulmates. I would say that a huge factor in the success of my relationship with my wife has to do with all the therapy that I've been through. Well, one place you can find a therapist to help with that is at BetterHelp. If you're thinking of starting therapy, it's definitely worth giving a try. So become your own soulmate, whether you're looking for one or not. Visit betterhelp.com slash Kirk today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Kirk. And I realized that's not a fog. That's that's a lot of bugs. Oh, ah, that's awful. You know, in my neck of the woods, it's worries of rain when you have an outdoor wedding, which is not wise in Seattle, of course. In the summer, it's unlikely to rain, but still, uh, I've never heard of an influx of a swarm of bugs that would ruin a wedding. So it looks like that's what's happening. But it looks like it's the end because the plates are empty. So, you know, maybe it's time to wrap up anyway. There's hundreds of bugs everywhere. Okay. You okay, Bobby? Over here. Jeez. Yeah, I would say it's time to pack it up. <laughs> that, that is, if you described it, you would not understand the level of bugitude that's happening. Kill that light, Jesus. Kill the light. I'm trying, dude. I'm being swarmed. I'm gonna Mom, I'm here with you, right? You're looking good. There's no bugs on you. Is that the mom? Yeah. Uh, yeah, right. She doesn't like bugs. I think she has a pretty significant phobia of bugs. She showed that before. This would be her nightmare. That, at least, I, at least, I think that's the mom. And, the breathing indicates a high level of anxiety. Okay, I don't see any bugs Honey, on you. I need my hair. <laughs> my mom's having like a panic attack. Sorry, mom. Yeah, yeah, it's, that's too bad. This could make it worse. It could make her phobia worse. It also could help. It could be a form of like extreme exposure. It depends on how it is, uh, how it how it progresses here. Meaning that if she were allowed to stay in that environment with a lot of bugs and learn to relax, not only consciously, but also her body would habituate, then there's an opportunity for her body to actually adjust and habituate to bugs such that she doesn't get triggered by them anymore. That's the way exposure and habituation works. But it also could backfire if it's too much too soon in that it can make the association with fear and the stimulus, the bugs, to be even more severe. Oh. And that's why if you ever do exposure therapy for a phobia or for PTSD or complex PTSD, then you need to be with a specialist that understands not only how to administer this form of therapy safely, but also how to gauge from the client what is too fast and what is too slow. I'm keeping them off your behind so they're not following you, okay? In my hair, I yep, can't I'm waving your hair. Open, open. It's interesting, she keeps blowing out of her mouth, so I'm wondering if her uh, a specific phobia or a significant part of it is worries of the bugs getting inside of her or inside of her mouth or something that it, it's not necessarily rational because if the bugs aren't venomous or harmful in any way then it's not an actual danger it's an annoyance probably I don't know what sort of they sound like they're beetles but phobias aren't rational so okay come here come here you're okay Think about the wedding, think about how beautiful it was, okay? Before the bugs came in and ruined it all. <laughs> Just... So, yeah, I feel bad for the mom, of course. And I'm also noticing that he's taking care of her, which is good. And they're two adults, and there's nothing wrong with 
uh, role reversal or an adult son taking care of their adult mother. But is this emulative of what was going on in the bad days in the past? Maybe during the, you know, the when she was suffering from a drug addiction and eventually lost, uh, you know, custody of him? Or does this just indicate that their relationship has changed such that he's able to do this or he's just mature now? Or was he parentified even younger? Does this phobia and reactivity uh, point to a larger PTSD? I, I wouldn't be surprised if she did have other kinds of traumas and reactivity and that her nervous system is in a frequent state of of panic from a variety of triggers, not just bugs. I don't know any of that, but I don't know. It, it, these are all just questions. Having said all that, there's absolutely nothing pathological about what's happening right now. She, she has a fairly normal phobia that would benefit from treatment, and he's taking care of her. She's dealing with it the way that you would, and I can't imagine how much panic she's in. It's Or I can, actually, because I, I have anxiety too, not with bugs. I grew up with bugs. <laughs> My bedroom was in the basement of a house in Sammamish that was in a forest and the house was kind of in a little gully. And so the bugs would just sort of work their way into the house. And the bedroom I was in was at the very bottom surface level. So there was no crawl space. So, you know, bugs would come in and would just crawl all over me while I was sleeping. I became very accustomed to that. <laughs> and so, that's not my phobia. I, I, I've had my phobias in the past, but but not that. But so so I can. But but from those anxiety attacks, I, I can relate to what she's going through right now. It's it's awful. It's truly awful. I can I can tell you for a fact. I don't see or feel it in your hair. That's just in your mind, okay? That's just in your mind. I have never experienced something so literally traumatic to me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's possible that her phobia for bugs was never triggered to this point to this point because in her normal typical environment she could easily manage the bug situation, get rid of them, get away from them. In that scenario, <laughs> there was no getting away from. Them. I mean, there's still bugs inside the van because there's no way to open the door without a flood of at least some bugs getting in there. I'm going to get married and we're going to get out of here. Right, and then you're gonna be okay. Okay? Jeez Louise. It rains on your wedding day, it's unlucky or something, but it's raining down bugs. If if rain is unlucky, then a swarm of bugs is biblically bad. <laughs> I never imagined something will happen like this on my wedding day. It's so chaos. You okay, baby? Oh, they're inside. They're inside? Yeah, and then her dress, which is a fairly typical floof, I don't know what you call it, floofy dress. And yeah, there's so many nooks and crannies and it's like a it's like a fly trap. They they get up but they can't get out. Oh my god. Holy <laughs> I just lost the ring. I need to look for my wedding ring. <laughs> like I'm doing this and my ring came off. I, I I don't know what happened to it. So you can see money hanging off of them, and it's a, I don't know if it's Philippines wide, you know, all of the Philippines, but I know it's a Filipino custom to adorn the bride and groom with money by pinning it on them or taping it on them or something. And it's a way of giving to the family, setting them up for the future, that kind of thing. It's just gone. Jesus H. Roosevelt. Uh. Can't believe I would lose that this is getting worse and worse and worse the total disaster oh man and then he loses the ring because of the bugs <laughs> yeah wow 
why wasn't he why wasn't the ring on him all right well let's adjourn there everyone please take care of yourself truly because you deserve it you really really do